Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and welcome to this, the uh, 17th Pointer Lecture. My name's Ian McIntyre, I'm the president of the British Society for the History of Medicine. Um, before introducing this year's Pointer Lecture, I have some brief announcements to make. Uh, firstly, on behalf of the Society, I would like to thank the Wellcome Library, uh, who have yet again uh, hosted this event, provided uh, the venue, and very generously hosted the drinks reception that we've uh, just enjoyed. Uh, there are no fire drills planned uh, tonight, so if the fire alarm goes off, it's for real, and uh, make your way out through the nearest exit, two at the front and, uh, and two at the back. And uh, finally, let me draw your attention to uh, this and to the flyers uh, on your seats. Uh, this is about the Congress to be held next September in Edinburgh. And we very much hope that uh, as many of you as possible will be able to come and that you'll consider submitting a paper or two uh, to the Congress. As you can see, there are four themes to uh, the Congress, but uh, papers on any aspect of the history of medicine uh, will be welcome. So do make a note of the dates and keep an eye on our website where details uh, will be posted. Now, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce this year's uh, pointer lecturer, Dr. Sam Alberti, who is Keeper of Science and Technology at the National Museums of Scotland. Sam trained in the history of science and medicine and wrote his PhD thesis on late Victorian science. He became interested in museums as the focus of historical study before working in them, first at the Manchester Museum, and then, I think, as most of you know, as Director of Museums and Archives at the Royal College of Surgeons, which, of course, includes the world-famous Hunterian Museum. Sam has curated exhibitions on a variety of subjects, including race, museum history, and the First World War. He's published extensively with some 50 peer-reviewed articles and several books, uh, including Morbid Curiosities, Medical Museums in 19th Century Britain. His research has focused on the history of collections, in particular the trajectories and meanings of scientific, medical and natural objects in Britain since 1800. In 2015, he was visiting professor at the University of Edinburgh College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine, advising them on their historic anatomy collection. And during that time, the uh, talent spotters of the National Museum of Scotland recognized his talent, uh, and before he knew where he was, he took up his appointment there as keeper uh, in Edinburgh earlier this year. In this evening's pointer lecture, Sam will explore what medical collections can tell us about the lives and experiences of patients, past and present. So it's my great pleasure to invite Sam Alberti to deliver the 17th pointer lecture. Sam. <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed uh, for coming out this evening. Um, as the President just uh, explained, um, I'm, for the last six months I've been a middle manager in a public institution in Edinburgh. Before then, for five years, I was a middle manager in a membership organisation in London. <laughs> but both of these um, largely administrative roles have given me the opportunity to work with some really interesting people and some, with some really interesting collections. Um, and it's the medical aspect of those collections um, that I'd like to talk about this evening. Some observations about a welcome trend, pun intended, um, in medical museums in recent years. Um, looking at whose words are used, whose stories are told on display in our medical museums in the UK um, today. And I'd like to put them as a trained historian, I'd like to put them in historical um, perspective. So I'll be looking at the, the place, the role, the voice, the agency of patients on display in medical museums um, using our standing collections, many rich standing collections in the UK, using artistic interpretations of those collections, and using special exhibitions uh, to, to demonstrate those collections. 
So I want to look at how patients are represented alongside the clinicians who treated them and what problems can arise in representing patients' narratives and patient stories um, in these exhibitions. And I needn't tell an audience as expert as this that a medical museum is actually a catch-all phrase for a whole range of institutions but which we can loosely gather into two categories, which uh, one might call wet and dry, rather unfortunately, um, perhaps more politely organic and inorganic. So an anatomy, a pathology museum is a medical museum, but also a medical history museum, a museum of medical instruments and medical memorabilia is also a medical museum. Now, many places have both of these categories within their walls, um, but some have one or the other, but they have quite different trajectories, and I'll come back to that. It's a great honor, it goes without saying, to be the 17th pointer lecturer. Among the previous 16 are Martin Kemp, Jenny Uglo, Tilly Tanzi, and uh, my sorely missed mentor, John Pickstone. So the society has a has, has had a tradition of picking wise and erudite lecturers. And you seem to have um, knocked that tradition on the head this evening. <laughs> but as I was staring at this rather intimidating list, I thought, actually, what linked many of them was a slight twist on history of medicine. None of them, for the most part, did kind of pure internal history of medicine. They usually did it with a bit of a cultural twist or something coming in from left field. And perhaps if the erudite and wise tradition has finished, perhaps I can continue this tradition of just looking slightly, making the lens slightly broader. And I think that would be appropriate, given that Noel Pointer, um, you'll, we, we know him as a historian of, of Tudor medicine. But his I think his legacy lies not only in his intellectual contribution, but his organizational contribution. You'll know, of course, that he was director of the Wellcome Institute here, that he was your predecessor as president of the British Society, that he was a founding member of the Faculty of History of Medicine, the Society of Apothecaries, and also founder and editor of Medical History um, for two decades from its founding. But what I quite like was that he also worked as a young historian with Henry Wellcome himself on the Wellcome collection. And Henry, Sir Henry, Wellcome, will keep popping up over the course of the next 45 minutes or so. It's quite hard not to talk about Henry Wellcome if you're talking about medical collections in the UK, past and present. So the Wellcome collection, some of which is on display here, most of which um, is cared for by the Science Museum, includes, of course, both of the categories I spoke about. And so both of the trajectories of the Anatomy Museum and the Medical History Museum are represented in the um, uh, Wellcome's collection. So if we look first at the... Uh, what I'll do first, before looking at examples of this interesting trend towards patient narratives in museums, I'll quickly run through, I'll do a gallop through the history of medical museums. And I'll start with this specimen here. It's likely to have belonged, this diseased esophagus, et cetera, um, to Mrs. P, Mrs. P, a 52-year-old London woman who's a patient of the Scottish physician uh, Maxwell Gartshaw. Now, I find it interesting that we know more about Gartshaw's engagement with this specimen than we do about Mrs. P. Not, not P the word, it's P the letter, semi-anonymized. That reads better if it's written down, I realize now that I say it out loud. So we know that in the course of Gartshaw asking this specimen to be made after the post-mortem and then giving it to John Hunter, we know that Gartshaw's reputation and skill as a diagnostician was wrapped around it, but that the patient's identity was removed. And we know that in the course of which she became it and the patient became objectified and became an object. And this anonymization continues 
through. So this um, ends up in John Hunter's collection, which is the foundation of the Royal College of Surgeons of England museums in the 18th century. That's one of the very early teaching collections of anatomy and pathology that then give rise to much, I mean, it's a private collection initially, then is taken into an institutional collection, a pattern that is repeated across the UK, not least with John Hunter's older brother, William Hunter's collection as well. This pattern is repeated and these collections grow and there's a lot of historical attention paid to them in the 18th and the first parts of the 19th century. They're actually at their peak in terms of their size, in terms of their um, importance, scientific importance, in the early 20th century. Now, this is the first time this evening I'm going to play that age-old game of spot the medical museum. This should be very quick with such an audience as well-traveled as yourselves. Anybody identify any of these? Bart, top left, yep. And you haven't had your tea, so you're going to delay your supper and, until you identify them. I know at least one person was born in the country, in the audience was born in the country that the bottom right one is. No. Did I hear Virchow's museum? <laughs> At the Charité in Berlin? That's, you're very good. Um, top right is a bit trickier. That's the Army Medical Museum when it was at the Mall, which is now the National Museum of Health and Medicine, the US. And bottom left, rather closer to home. No? No? Precisely. Thank you. Welcome folk here who are being very sort of quiet and do that. <laughs> at that. At this point, I put it there not only to wake you up, because there's the point at which 10 minutes into a lecture where everyone's blood sugar dips, not only to wake you up, but at this point, they're huge. They are three-dimensional encyclopedias of disease. They're used a great deal in research. They're used a great deal in teaching. But the patient's identity, necessarily, it won't surprise you, the specimens are there as examples of disease. They're embodying the diseases, not the people. There are case studies included in the catalogues, but the patients are anonymized. The patient stories have been removed. At about the same time, this second category of medical museums is gathering pace um, in the late 19th and early 20th century. I include here on the right um, the shrine to Joseph Lister at the Hunterian Museum in the English College um, as an example of the growth of collections devoted to surgical heritage. The English College got Hunter's papers because um, uh, his, uh, uh, Rickman Godley, his nephew, was president at the time of his death. And so this massive collection comes to the English College. What I like about it is that in the uh, Lister instrument collection, which has this hallowed status, are the instruments that he designed, the instruments that he used, and also the instruments he was given but didn't necessarily like. And we know this. We have the catalog entries. We're saying, he said, oh, no, this one didn't much good. It's never been used. But because it's part of the Lister collection, because it's part of this hallowed material culture, it acquires this sort of status. And this um, uh, almost um, uh, religious uh, function of this material culture I find very interesting. I mean, after all, what is the Hunterian Museum if not a shrine to John Hunter and a shrine to Joseph Lister? But this heritage function is repeated um, across the board. On the left is uh, Howard Dittrich, who's gathered the collections that are now in the uh, Dittrich Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Very fine collection. Um, at this period, in 1905, the Smithsonian Institute sends out a collecting memo um, to get uh, medical uh, equipment. Um, and the Danish Medical Association's conference in 1907 gives rise to the collection that is now held by the Museum. Um, at the University of Copenhagen. But what these collections are there for is to celebrate and commemorate the contribution of the clinicians rather than the patients, 
But there was one chap at this time who was collecting that sort of material with great gusto, you know, sending trucks up to Glasgow to get Lister's, you know, the, the um, door handles from Lister's ward. But Henry Welcome, here he pops up again, it won't be the last time. Now, Welcome, I need not tell you, collects in such massive, his collecting remit, if it was a remit, is so large that he cannot help but gather the best collection, I think, in the world to represent the patient experience, as well as many other things. So in the 1970s, when the deaccessioning and rationalizing and redistributing the collections, it's the only collection I've come across as a museum professional where the deaccession wasn't by the shelf you know, meter, it wasn't by the, uh, by the item or collection, it was deaccessioned by the ton. Nonetheless, there were still some 100,000 or so objects that went to, um, to the Science Museum, now the Science Museum group, and those were used in uh, 1981, 1970s, and, and opened uh, first in 1981, new galleries, then new galleries about the history of medicine, and patients were well represented. Because of the approach of the curators and because of the character of the collection, patients were well represented. These, of course, have been closed now, and they are now working on new galleries which will open in 2019, which, to my knowledge, will be the largest, certainly the most expensive medical history galleries um, in the world, I think. So no pressure if there are any Science Museum colleagues here. But, um, and I've chatted them a little bit about it, and patients will be very well represented there. I think it's a very exciting um, prospect. But in the meantime, for the rest of us who operate on a slightly humbler level, Welcome Money was instrumental in a, a quiet renaissance in medical heritage around um, the turn of the, the century. Um, this is slightly easier. Name those museums. Yep, so Surgeons Hall in Edinburgh just reopened again with my colleague and friend Chris Henry posing as pit cairn in the middle there. Uh, top right, Hunterian, yes. Bottom right? American? No? Yes, Muta. It's the Muta Museum. And these three, I think, uh, embodied a movement around about um, in the early years of this um, century, where are we now, yes, um, of medical heritage. Um, it, there was a sort of takeover of heritage professionals working alongside um, clinicians to reinterpret and, and Redisplay um, these collections, and they were done very well. Shall I let you off this particular hook? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Fleming, bottom right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Flory, bottom left. Yep. Yeah. Jenna, top left and William Hunterian, Glasgow Hunterian, top right. So what do they all have in common? Yes. So they are all named after a great figure in the history of medicine. And so they do have sophisticated, you know, the Flory, for example, sophisticated displays that have a range of narratives, but they are necessarily geared towards their, their eponymous, I mean, not founder, but their, their, their eponymous character. So it may be that we won't look there for necessarily for patient narratives, even though they are to be found. So I've now brought us up to date, I hope, um, and I want to look at three categories of, of ex exhibition to look for patient narratives. First, the, the permanent galleries of some of the medical museums we just talked about. Second, as I said, artistic reinventions. And third, some temporary exhibitions, some of which aren't so temporary, but actually, because of where we are now, many of them focusing on the First World War. So my favorite gallery, and I would say this even if my colleagues who run it were here, um, is at the Charité in, in Berlin. And it's a, it's a sort of slight offshoot of the main displays. Um, at the Charité. It's in an old ward of the hospital. And each of those beds is 
a case of a patient over the 250 plus years of the charity. So you've got a pregnant woman in, 19, in 1727 who exhibited a difficult birth, a man with fever, there's a three-year-old boy with polio and the iron lung he was treated with in the 1950s. There's a young woman with psychosis who took her own life um, and a person with liver, a patient with liver failure who gained a new organ in 1990. So you get the whole spread of treatment and diagnosis embedded in the patient experience and spread out very simply and very nicely. I feel duty bound, however, to present some good examples from National Museum Scotland, my paymasters, who are, we're being broadcast or recorded. So National Museum Scotland, great place. <laughs> Um, and this isn't actually, I'm, I have the advantage that it's quite possible for me to, to extol the virtues of Chambers Street uh, without um, uh, showing off because I arrived three months before all the galleries opened, so I had no creative input in whatsoever. My contribution was largely buying donuts for the curators. Um, but one of the reasons I went was that I'd had a sneak preview of the plans and I knew these galleries were going to be really good. They're mostly science and technology, but they're massive, so the small element of medical healthcare, biomedicine that is exhibited through these galleries, thanks to the munificence of the Wellcome Trust, um, has some really nice examples of um, uh, patient experience of contemporary biomedicine. And it goes alongside the approach taken by the technology curators about the user experience of technologies, about the impact of technological change on everyday life. So this isn't unique to medical museums. It's actually taking the best from other areas of science and technology. So on the right here is John Scott, who is a member of the Lothian Birth Cohort, which will be familiar to you um, as the children in Scotland who were born in 1921 or, as in John's case, in 1936, who were uh, tested for what was then called the Scottish Mental, um, Mental Health Survey, Mental Survey and then tested over the years. So that's John on the right, that's him in the middle of the front row with his, with his schoolmates. Um, they scanned in the most recent test, they scanned his brain. The museum took the data and made a three-dimensional model and uh, clear uh, plexiglass etching. So John's looking very happy with his brain, which it turns out is slightly asymmetrical, which he was delighted with. So uh, we had John's words, we had John attended the opening and accosted the Secretary of State for, the Scottish Secretary of State for Culture, accused her, who was his local MP. I hope I managed to kind of have off a, um, uh, any political debate because as a Scottish quasi-civil servant, I am totally neutral, hive this off, and they had a great time talking about um, his brain. The second of three examples um, in the uh, National Museum Scotland displays uh, is a small case around uh, the experience of asthma. So my colleagues worked with um, Asthma UK um, with a patient group, a, a volunteer patient group, um, uh, as to what they felt represented their experience of asthma. And of course, it's the... Um, uh, all the very common rather than, you know, as well as very particular, very rare, innovative technologies, we've got the everyday, the very common technology like the inhaler. But that's juxtaposed with, oh, which, sorry, I've chopped off at the top of the slide there, uh, a picture and a rugby ball signed by Scott McLeod as a rugby player who lives with asthma. And this brings us on to one of the fairly tricky elements of how to display um, the experience of uh, disease and, and disability is the, the valorization. So it's all very well um, you know, presenting you know, all the great and good things that people can do despite their disability, but one wants to walk a fine line, and we'll come back to that later on. Um, the Royal Scottish Museum, as it was then, had a fine uh, collection of um, uh, prosthetics. And in this case, we see an early series uh, two, Simpson Series 2 prosthetic arm at the top, 
and at the bottom the Edinburgh modular arm system used by, um, designed by David Gow and his team in Edinburgh and used by Campbell Aird. So this brings us on to another slight complexity as I'm talking about putting patients on display but should we not be thinking less about patients, more about users. These are technologies that have users who wouldn't necessarily identify themselves as patients. This is how they're displayed in the galleries um, at Chambers Street, a close-up of the case on your left and the, um, the overall display on the right. And so even though the prosthetics are displayed, you know, isolated almost as sculpture. The context, the exhibitionary context gives um, their use. So we're talking about prosthetics more generally and there's a very nice display of wheelchair technology on the right. But there is a challenge here that again, we're presenting what disability activists have termed the super crip. This is demonstrating what people can do to overcome their disability and their, their um, uh, any disfigurement or acquired disability they may have. And the problem is, as one of the users of these technologies um, put to one of my colleagues, you know, when there was a display around a, a serviceman who'd gone on, you know, to despite uh, double limb loss to run marathons and so on, she said, well, all credit to him. And I'm sure I could run a marathon, but I just don't want to. So in terms of the experience of using prosthetics and so on, there's that fine line between victimization and valorization. And one of the ways I found really interesting that it's done in Edinburgh is with um, some of those, uh, the top prosthetic there is uh, uh, under, um, built by the Edinburgh group. Um, in response to the thalidomide um, tragedy for the thalidomide survivors when they were children. And we see here Michael Shannon and Yvonne Kavanagh um, in front of displays. And then the, on the left is a screenshot from the virtual label you get in front of those um, technologies where you can dig further into the stories. So we're able to wrap stories around the objects using digital media. And what's important there is you'll notice that neither Yvonne nor Michael are wearing any sort of prosthetic. And that's because the, as, as teenagers, um, these prostheses, which you know, were wonderful feats of technology, were incredibly cumbersome, difficult, and unpleasant to wear. So they stopped wearing them. So in terms of we're thinking about medical technologies, I think there's just as interesting a story of lack of use as there is about use. And you only get that, you only get that if you start talking or looking for the patient narratives. So, let me return to my old stomping grounds in Lincoln's Inn Fields and have a think about the, you know, what is an, again, an eponymous museum uh, shrine, as I've said, to, to Hunter and, and Lister. But there were some excellent um, examples of patient experience laced through those displays. This is my favorite. It's a sampler by Charlotte Waite. You'll know this story, who was the um, treated uh, with, underwent an operation to remove her leg uh, under chloroform in 1848, and then survived pretty much against the odds, as we know, um, and made this sampler. I think as a piece of material culture, I, to this day, find it incredibly moving. But there are more complex stories to be had around the human remains on display. So Charles Byrne, possibly the most famous resident of the Hunterian, one of the reasons he, his case had attracted so much attention is that we know his story so well that he was not anonymized, that his, the narrative, his posthumous charisma overcame the process of anonymization. And that's one of the reasons it's the, you know, the, his blessing and his curse that we know so much about him. But of course, 
every one of the 2,000 individuals represented in the Crystal Gallery in the Hunterian has a story to tell, even if we don't know their names. This is one of the most moving, I find, is a, a scoliotic spine. And although the label gives bald clinical details, on the audio guide that my colleagues put together before I arrived there, um, Ruth Richardson speaks, the historian Ruth Richardson speaks very movingly about um, the specimen because she lives with that condition too, which as you'll know, um, can be intensely painful um, and debilitating. So in that uh, audio guide, it's Ruth responding emotionally to what she sees on display. And this is something that runs through some of the artworks, which is the second of the categories I was talking about. And I'll take one uh, again from before my time at the Hunter in Narrative Remains, which was a collaboration between my uh, predecessor, um, Simon Chaplin, and the artist Karen Ingham. And what Karen did was to select some specimens from around the Hunterian, and then using film, photography, and text, she reimagined their case. So shown here um, is the um, voice box, etc., of Marion Dalrymple, who was an opera singer who then um, uh, lost her voice and, and died from the condition. There was also the reimagining of my predecessor's favorite specimen, um, the rectum of Thomas Turlow, Bishop of Durham. And what Ingham said about this um, uh, project was that by reuniting human remains with patients, and projecting their first-person narratives back onto the sites of dissection, the body parts become whole. They are names, not just numbers. And actually, that specimen was used um, here at the What is a Voice exhibition earlier in this year. There have recently been a raft of really exciting projects led by the University of Leicester, which Hunterian Museum was, was one partner of, um, but the Royal College of Physicians in London was actually the, the, the first collaborator um, with this strand of work um, led, as I said, by Leicester, where they had a project reframing disability. They re-examined their historic portraits and dug around and retold the stories around those portraits from, as far as possible, the perspective of the sitters, and juxtaposed them with people living with disabilities today. So on your left is Karen Sutherland from Edinburgh, as it happens, who participated in the project as a focus group member. And on your right, the artist um, Tom, Thomas Inglefield, born in 1769. So again, we're coming back to this important thing. Karen wouldn't identify herself as a patient. Neither, as far as we know, would Thomas. So actually, I'm going beyond my remit here and thinking about telling the narratives of the people who live with particular conditions who wouldn't necessarily identify themselves as patients. And identifying the patients is actually part of a medical model of disability that disability activists are now seeking to challenge with a, or have been seeking to challenge for some time with a social model. It's not a problem. Disability isn't a problem to be fixed, but rather society's attitude to disability is what we need to address. These projects carried on, uh, the indefatigable Richard Sundell and Jocelyn Dodd at the helm. Um, they worked with the thalidomide survivor artist Matt Fraser, um, who uh, ran a pilot project called How Disability Was Kept in a Box and did some performances in various medical collections. I was privileged to be involved in one. It was actually ended up being a very learned lecture on uh, the history of the interrelationship between disability and the medical institution with every now and again he would burst out he's a musician as well he burst out in 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 rap um, which was surprising but illuminating and it, it kept us all awake that gave rise to a larger project called exceptional extraordinary which was more museums and more artists so shown here on the left um, uh, on the right is uh, Emma Shepley showing comedian Francesca Martinez through the Royal College of Physicians material. On the left, Stuart Emmons, remember that name, showing filmmaker David Heathy um, in the stores of the Science Museum. Um, again, looking at prosthetics there. We'll, we'll 
we'll see both Stuart and that arm again. That gave rise to four performances, which were thought-provoking um, and engaging and tragic and comedic. However, they didn't really engage with the collections themselves. They were the individuals, each of the individual has worked with or experiences a particular form of disability, but they didn't actually engage very much in the end with the collections. An exhibition that really put the patients front and center um, is one that will be on display, I think will be the last uh, display at the Hunterian before it closes, it should open in November. Um, is a collaboration between photographer Tim Wainwright and sound artist John Wynne, where they worked with um, uh, the Harefield Hospital Middlesex with patients who were anticipating and then um, uh, recovering from transplants. Um, and it's very rare. They actually had, I don't think we have time this evening, but they actually used not only the photography, um, but also the patient's voices themselves. And I include um, this patient, uh, you know, his words are very moving, but also, as you can see, he supports the best football team in the country. <laughs> <coughs> Arguably. But again, John and Tim, one of the reasons why it's an excellent display to have, as the rest of the uh, Royal College of Surgeons of England um, readapts itself is because it's a pure installation. It doesn't. It draws from the collections, but doesn't actually use them. One that did draw on the collections, and one that I tried. This one I was involved in, and I tried to set out to put our money where my mouth was, or vice versa, and present patient narratives alongside a story of you know real medical advances was in the War Art and Surgery program. And this is, we're coming to, towards the end now. I've got the final trinity of exhibitions, all of them focusing around the First World War because we're in the midst of commemorating, at that time, the outbreak and now the midpoint of, of the war. And what we wanted to do, so firstly on the right, um, we gathered all the information, all the portraits, pastel portraits by surgeon artist Henry Tonks, who uh, made very moving portraits of the patients of Harold Gillies, the pioneering reconstructive surgeon. So on the right here is Private Walter Ashworth from the 18th West Yorkshire Regiment, the so-called Bradford Pals, who was injured on the 1st of July, 1916, aged 23 during the Battle of the Somme. He sustained a gunshot wound to his mouth and a fractured mandible was admitted to the Cambridge Military Hospital at Aldershot, where Gillies was then before more moving to, to Sidcup, where he's more famous for. Um, he was admitted on the 5th of July. He underwent three operations, two of them by Harold Gillies. Um, Gillies then was said to be satisfied with the outcome, noting what he called a whimsical, one-sided expression that was not entirely unpleasant. Ashworth left the hospital in September 7, 1917, discharged from the army. He returned to work as a tailor, but was faced with prejudice because of his disfigurement and demoted to work in the back of the shop rather than with customers. Furthermore, his fiancée left him, but he married her best friend, emigrated to Australia, um, and then returned in the 1950s to the UK to work as a tailor in Blackpool. So what we do in this project, there are uh, 72 uh, images from Tonks and the Royal College of Surgeons collection. We combined them with material that was at UCL, where Tonks had gone on to be um, Slade Professor, and gathered all the information we knew about those patients. It wasn't all 70, but it was many of them. A lot of this was thanks to Dr. Andrew Bamji, who was honorary curator of the Gillies Archive. His encyclopedic knowledge of um, the Sidcup and Aldershot work um, was very welcome. So as a historian, as historians, I think we succeeded in gathering and telling the patients' stories, not from the perspective, not only from the perspective of Tonks and Gillies, but from Ashworth and his colleagues' perspectives. But what we wanted to do was to juxtapose this with the experience of the equivalent experience of personnel serving and, and recovering from injuries today. 
So we worked with a wonderful artist called Julia Midgley, who's a reportage artist who does these very rapid on-site sketches that then have very little after work done to them. Um, she set out to look for uh, uh, experience of patients with facial injuries, but of course what um, facial shrapnel injuries were to trench warfare in the First World War, limb loss is to IEDs in Afghanistan and Iraq. So Julia worked with uh, recovering service personnel and their, their support teams um, at Headley Court, the Defence Medical Rehabilitation Centre. And on your left is Andy Reid, who I spoke to um, about this picture when he came back into the college. He said, in this picture, I was just going to get up and walk out of the room. Oh, he'd um, uh, uh, lost uh, multiple limb loss um, in recent conflict. In this picture, I was just going to get up and walk out of the room. I was about to attach the other prosthetic as there's no point in wearing one leg. I don't wear that electric arm very often because it's heavy. Again, coming back to the stories of lack of use or choice. Julia's picture looks to me said Andy, a bit unfinished. Without my leg, I look a bit unfinished too. I think the more people know about rehabilitation, the better. Soldiers' deaths are in the news, but not what happens to those of us recovering from injuries. However, of the 150 images that Julian made, we were only able to secure testimony from three of them, because the others, we made the mistake of then, you know, she'd sketch and then we tried to get back in touch. The others had other things to do. They weren't particularly bothered. Many were no longer in the forces. So, you know, she'd been an artist, an, an MOD approved artist at Headley Court, uh, quite relaxed, you know, often having people wander in and, and take photographs and so on. But afterwards, you know, there was no rudeness, but there was just no particular uh, motivation to be involved. So in terms of recapturing capturing patient narratives, for the historical patients, the long dead patients, we had much more information than we did for the current um, personnel. A little bit more luck, luck, a little bit more successful in this respect uh, was an exhibition um, is an exhibition at the Army, um, uh, the National War Museum of Scotland, which is part of National Museum of Scotland. It's the branch that's in Edinburgh Castle. Um, and there is there a, an exhibition called Life Support, Stories from the Royal Regiment of Scotland. The Royal Regiment is the new regiment in Scotland that is um, now a decade old. And to mark that decade, uh, they worked with the National Museum of Scotland curators to put on uh, an exhibition, not so much around the history, of the, you know, the, this young history of the regiment, but about the support systems that help them on the front line, that help them in their humanitarian work as well. And amongst that support systems, amongst those support systems were the uh, medical treatment. And the curators worked with, and you can just see on the right there, they worked with regimental veterans who were living with injuries that acquired during combat with the regiment. But it's quite a small part of the overall exhibition. A much larger part is played by patients in the Science Museum's Wounded exhibition, which um, if I tell you secretly, I really like, but don't tell the Science Museum group, they'll, they'll be insufferable. But it's Stuart Emmons, again, was, uh, was a key part of the team that put Wounded together. So they had more success. So in the exhibition, very fine exhibition, a lot of uh, um, technology from Hen uh, Wellcome's collection, from the Imperial War Museum, from the Science Museum group, um, and, you know, alongside, um, you know, early 20th century prosthetics, they've got patient stories and so on. I mean, they've also got the classic, you know, Thomas Splint sculpture alone in the case, but you can sort of project onto that. But what they did really well was a very tricky project. At the end of the exhibition, in its own section, they worked with 
the charity Combat Stress and service personnel who are supported by that charity who are living with who are living with PTSD. And they genuinely co-curated that segment. So they put in a lot of time, a lot of care, a lot of effort, a lot of support networks for this process to work with a small group of PTSD, of veterans who experience PTSD. And they put together the exhibition. It's their words that are on the labels. It's their choice of material. So there's a lucky charm there. Bottom right is the, the knee pad still with some bloodstains on. The T-shirt in the middle, if you can just see, is a T-shirt with shrapnel holes in that, he, that, the, that the, the soldier survived, but then it came back to haunt him because not, many, not all of his colleagues did. So as a result, the voices of the personnel are there. They've written the texts. They're in the, the film projected. And there's a risk there as well for the institution because co-curation is a very tricky political and museological balance. And the science museums were quite open about this. They wanted, there was risk to the service personnel involved. This is a very difficult and moving thing. So they had clinical support networks in place. Curators aren't therapists. But there was also a risk to the science museum. Science museum has very high curatorial quality values. There was a risk to the output, uh, to the product in the end. Um, but I think they balance those, they manage those risks, and I think, and I hope if you've seen it, still on. Um, I hope you'll, it's still on for two years, I think, isn't it? Um, I think it's successful. So if I may conclude, Mr. Chair, if I got a couple of minutes? It's a very exciting time. The, the point at which I'm leaving the medical museum sector is a very exciting time to be part of it. Um, and science, um, uh, <laughs> medicine, remains within my remit, I'm very pleased to say. It's an exciting time to be visiting medical museums as well, especially, I think, the uh, developments in South Kensington, these new galleries, will be extremely interesting to watch. And I think we are getting the perspectives not only of the clinicians, but of patients, of nurses, of technicians, of, of the extended surgical team. We're getting multiple voices, multiple experiences, and multiple representations. So this is slightly chopped off at the top there, sorry. Um, this is a, an oil by Andrew Hay um, of a patient um, in Dundee, uh, called known as called Humor Cole, known as Shuggy, um, who Hay met and was transfixed by, and then painted him. He was struck by the intensity of Shuggy's expression, and drew parallels to El Greco's painting of Christ. And this is on display as part of the Tayside Medical History Museum in the hospital, but it's on display, you know, next to a good ten or twelve you know, portraits etc. of the great clinicians of the hospital and then just this one patient staring powerful at you. But then to reflect, maybe Shuggy's portrait should be somewhere else. Maybe it doesn't belong alongside the clinicians. Is it, I ask myself, in this as in all things, is this a very minor curatorial worry? Do our visitors actually want to go along and just see the stories of the great advancements in medical science over the last 300 years. Maybe, you know, the everyday experience, we live the everyday experience every day. Why do we want to then see that in a museum? Do we want not the museum to be a place where we go to see the extraordinary? There's this challenge of going somewhere between the superhero and the victim. And maybe you could argue that in uh, framing Shuggy in this way, Hay has made Shuggy a victim, a patient, where Shuggy didn't feel that way. But I think there's somewhere between the hero and the cripple is a middle way that I think can really enhance our experience of medical museums to tell not only the undeniable advances made by medical science and by clinicians, he adds quickly with so many in the room, over the last 300 years, but also the experience 
of the history from below. And this, as I've mentioned, is something that is common across social history museums and technology museums, which medical history museums should share practice with, should and do share practice with. But I do think there is something very particular about medical museums of both sorts. Because when we look at human remains, when we look at instruments in a case, we're not only looking at technologies and organic specimens. There's a very powerful visceral connection with things that were once people and with tools that are made to invade us, uh, to cure us. So, if we roll in the patient experience, I think we must roll in the patient experience, we then have museums of medicine and healthcare rather than museums, just museums of medics, museums of surgery rather than just museums of surgeons. Because I think William Hunter, and I can now relax about using William Hunter's words, uh, whereas previously I always need to find a John Hunter quote, William Hunter talked about the necessary inhumanity that a clinician needed to do what the clinician did. I think as curators, we should avoid that necessary inhumanity. I think we have a necessary humanity. And I think that's what Henry Wellcome would have wanted. And I think it's what Pointer would have wanted. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Is there a danger here that the museum curators are assuming upon themselves the responsibility of speaking for patients and saying how patients should be represented? I mean, I'm struck by this, uh, the, the, the amputees who didn't want to be, uh, have their narratives uh, told. Um, how, how do you know that this is what is good for patients or what patients want to be represented like this? We don't, and that's a very good point, because as curators, we're thinking we know more about what our visitors want because of you know, the good quality of evaluation um, that is undertaken in museums today. But in terms of there aren't, to my knowledge, rigorous data around what, how patients would want to be depicted. What we can go by is the, um, is the testimony and the conversations with people we do work with. So Michael and Yvonne, for example, were delighted to be represented in the gallery in Chambers Street, um, um, National Museum uh, Scotland. And it was their take on the story, they, their corrective on the story that they were pleased with. The service personnel in war art and surgery, it's not that they objected, it's just that they weren't particularly invested. They didn't you know, want to come to the launch and so on. It wasn't that they you know, were hostile. They were benignly indifferent. And that's a good point. So you know, at that point, perhaps we should have thought about not including the images at all. You're right. Hi. What do you think about um, displaying things at microscopic level um, for instance, and books that are written about things like that. Um, obviously, it's used in art quite a bit, as you see in the welcome cards. But, for instance, the healer cells from Henrietta Lack that are, are very, very useful in um, laboratory work. And the, the display in museums of things at that level rather than gross pathology. Um, and the stories behind them. I mean, the, the Henrietta Lack family were a bit... Um, reticent about having a publication. I think the microphone might not be on, so I'll, reiter I'll, I'll, I'll repeat that. Broadly speaking, the question was about what to do with microscopic yeah. um, cellular histology um, uh, images. Um, that, that was a very tricky issue that we did encounter um, when I was at the Hunterian, and there was one artwork that we did not feel had the appropriate consent machinery around it, so we did not exhibit. I think the they need as you know uh, 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 cellular representation, histo histological imagery needs as much um, care as the the gross images. We wouldn't use a patient's uh, representation, you know, on a photographic or gross level without the appropriate permissions, and. You know, similarly, we wouldn't use the, the the cellular level either. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it's a very important point that I didn't deal with, but the the lax question is a very um, tricky one. Question from the lady at the back. Hi, sorry. Um, I'm quite interested in this question of um, co-curation and co-production, like specifically the kind of pragmatics of it. I was just wondering, in your experience. Um, what kind of limitations have you personally have had, like have set on the kind of co-production and co-curation? Because I'm quite, because I feel like in theory you kind of want it to be unlimited, right? You kind of want that kind of authority to be completely shared, but in reality, like how often do you find that it's kind of weighted more towards you in a sense? Like how complete can co-curation be for you in your experience? That's a very good question. Um, I was involved in a co-curating project um, in 2008, uh, which failed. Actually, I keep, <laughs> I keep seeming to fail at these projects um, because uh, the project got a little bit out of hand and three months before we were still debating the content of the exhibition three months before and the museum had to step in the museum had to exert its authority because of the strictures of the project management, um, because we needed to deliver a product. Um, and so the exhibition was staged, but without the buy-in of the, all of those we were intended to co-curate with. And that was an uncomfortable experience um, that we then wrote up. 
So the exhibition wasn't very good, but we won a prize for the paper about it, <laughs> um, which I shouldn't be quite as proud of as I am. The, what the Science Museum did with their co-curating partners, and co-curation is very hot, very trendy in museology at the moment, as you'll know clearly, um, is they were very clear about the limitations. They did very, um, put a lot of care into expectation management from the get-go. And the, the um, service personnel understood that. So they said, well, look, you know, we need to deliver by certain deadlines. We need it to be of a particular quality. We need to edit your words down to a particular word length. Um, this is where there are you know, flexibility and, and this is where there are parameters and it seemed to work for them. Are there more questions? Yes, the uh, lady in the middle, if you wait for the microphone. Thank you. Um, in your experience, what role have or might medical ethicists play in the creation of medical exhibitions? We're being recorded. <laughs> Were I feeling unkind after an experience with medical ethicists um, who were quite robust in their criticism during uh, a discussion of Charles Burns' remains, uh, were I bearing any sort of grudge from that, I'd say none whatsoever. But of course I don't, and I'm deeply professional. Um, uh, I think that uh, we work in Edinburgh with the group there, the centre whose name I've just forgotten. I think that one works in medical humanities and medical museology with a whole range of different elements of the sector and the profession. Um, I think that the ethics of human remains is deeply complex and important um, and can't be tackled by museum ethics alone. It needs to work with sensible medical ethicists alongside. Does that slip away from your collection, your question, um, sufficiently? Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm sure you will agree that we have been entertained this evening to a pointer lecture in the illustrious tradition of the, the pointer lectures. It's been eloquent, it's been instructive, it's been authoritative, it's been moving, and it's certainly been uh, thought-provoking. And on behalf of the British Society of the History of Medicine, Sam, let me just relieve you of that. Uh, can I present you, I think our official photographer is hovering, uh, with uh, this pointer medal as a token of our appreciation for your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>